Are you ready to navigate the new way to work? Forbes Books presents Dare to Care in the Workplace with Kathleen Quinn Botaw. Here's Kathleen. My guest this week is a man who knows how to rock the drums and the business world. Sandy Gennaro has played with some of the most legendary artists in the music world, and he has shared his wisdom and insights with thousands of people across the globe. He is the author of a best-selling book, Beat the Odds in the Business and Life, where he reveals the secrets of success that he learned from his amazing career. Sandy, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much, Kathleen. I appreciate you having me. Thank you so much. My pleasure. So as we are setting up for this, I told you, my husband and I and some of my team had the absolute pleasure to see you on January 31st at Vistage International Worldwide Chair World, where we were astounded by your presentation, standing on our feet, tapping with the drums, singing all the songs. And that's why I wanted to have you on the podcast, because I love your message. I appreciate that. I, I love sharing the message. I think it's a message that people need to hear in business or out. Yes. And you can tell it's so from the heart. So start. let's start with, you know, how did you transition from being a musician to being a speaker and an author and inspiring audiences all over the world? It actually speaks to one of the elements in my presentation, which is, you know, the service to others, the blind service to others. You know, a lot of times the universe works and puts people and, and ideas in your place according to what your goals are. Sometimes the universe intervenes and gives you an opportunity to do something better than you ever imagined. I had no plan on what I was going to do after I retired from, from going on the road for months at a time with a rock and roll band. In 2016, I was in an arena in San Diego playing a gig. And as I do all the time during the encore, I see who is going to be the recipient of my drumsticks because I throw drumsticks out to the audience after. And there was a woman in a wheelchair this night in San Diego. The woman in the wheelchair, she was kind of smiling and during the show, and I was noticing she was having a really, really good time. And uh, I said, she's going to be the one to get my drumstick. After the show, I threw her drumstick, and it was intercepted by the guy next to her. And I, I could have kept going. But I wanted her to have it. I wanted to put a smile on this woman's face. I said, I went back and I went, no, she's got to have it. And he handed to her. I replaced his drumstick. The next day, the husband sitting on the other side of the handicapped woman Facebook messaged me and says, can I call, can I call you? Can I have your phone number? And again, I could have blew him off. I was thinking, well, maybe she got a splinter. Maybe I poked her eye out. <laughs> I took a leap of faith and I gave him my phone number. He called me and he, and he was over the top. Uh, how appreciative, not only him, but how his wife was so appreciative of me singling her out out of 20,000 people to get my drumstick. It turns out that he says, can I meet you for coffee? This is the husband. Can I meet you for coffee? I'm coming to Nashville to speak. I could have turned him down 10 o'clock on a Saturday morning, downtown Nashville. Do I want to do that? No, but I did. I went down, I met him. He asked me how I got certain gigs, how I got Cindy Lauper's gig, how I got Jones gig, whatever. And then he invited me to his speaking engagement, which he gave subsequently after the coffee meeting. And he introduced me on the side of the stage and he told the story of how I got Cindy Lauper's gig. And the result of that five minute encounter and how that changed my life. This gentleman, the husband, was a Vistage speaker. And every time he came to Nashville, he invited me to the Vistage meetings and for me as just the, as a guest. And, and, and he encouraged me to become a speaker because he said my story was very powerful. And at first, I had my doubts, to be honest. I'm a drummer in a rock and roll band. What am I going to share of value with CEOs and, and founders of different companies or whatever? And he said, no, Sandy, everybody's got to hear this message. Subsequently, I met some Vistage chairs here in Nashville, and I started speaking on, on and the, the husband's name is Antarctic Mike. Well, I love Antarctic Mike. Like, call out to Mike. I love Mike. Hi, Mike. Hi, Mike. Mike Pierce. He's been my my muse. He's been my mentor. He's been my encourager. Uh, he's been my sounding board for the last four or four years or something. So based on on that, he encouraged me to be a Vistage speaker. I, I went ahead and got vetted out of, in San Diego. I had to give all the emails and whatever, all of that. 
And then I had to do you my had to two- run the gauntlet to be a speaker. I had to run, <laughs> and run the gauntlet, exactly. <laughs> so then I had to do my two pro bonos. So I reached out to the chairs that I met as a result of going to Mike's meetings here in Nashville. And they gave me up at Clark Fatuli as one and Rod Thurley as another. And I became social, good friends with these two chairs. You know, we meet, meet for coffee every once in a while. So they would always ask me, when are you going to speak for Visage? When you, and I, and I, I, again, I was a little hesitant at first, but then I went ahead and, and I, I jumped off the gauntlet and applied and I did my pro bonos. And here I am. I was highly rated a 4.65 out of a five uh, based on those pro bonos that I did for Clark and Rod and uh, became a Visage speaker. And it got a really good good reaction. I was working pretty steadily. I started like in the midst of the pandemic, like towards the end of the pandemic, I started speaking for Vistage. I did mostly because of the politics involved. They did a lot of live gigs in Texas and in Florida during the tail end of the pandemic where there was still a math thing or whatever. But the, the key was, and what this astounded me when I was asked to present at Chair World, that was like a shock to me. And I was so humbled and you know, they said, you're going to do an hour. You're going to do an hour keynote. Don't go over a, a minute over the hour. And I was here in Nashville at the Hyatt Regency. So I was ba- able to bring my own drums, which I do in a keynote situation. And now it's catching on since since um, Chair World. Some chairs are asking me to, to bring drums. Yeah. Have yeah. drums sent to, to their meeting or whatever. So I tell them, listen, there's some logistics involved. You, gotta, you can't be in a conference room with a U-shaped table. It's got to be in a venue suitable for live drumming. And I need a little bit of an augmented PA so I can play along with the tracks. And some of them are obliging. And I'm, I'm, that's basically a long-winded explanation of how I got started. It just speaks to the fact that when, you know, you look for every opportunity to put a smile on somebody's face. Because, Kathleen, how I, I believe that we're going to be judged in the end time is the fact that how we made people feel. It has to do with leadership. It has to do with CEOs. It has to do with management and their team, CEOs and their executive team. It, it's all about relationships. It's all about the personal encounter with the person. Even if it's just, well, Sandy, I'm a CEO and I have 500 employees. I can't know every one of them. But you can pass by every once in a while their desk and pat them on the back and say, hi, what's your name? Any kind of interaction, no matter how trivial is really important because the person you're interacting with thinks that you care the fact that you're speaking to them especially if you ask them questions walk by their desk and say who's that picture of oh that's my daughter we're at disney world oh how how was your trip or whatever whatever it really means a lot you know the same thing i can go on and on about it well and i agree with you my second book dare to care in the workplace is Mm -hmm. all about having a little faith in people building community making sure you put people first always. And what you did for Mike Pierce's wife is you put her first and then everything else followed. But you have another story about putting someone first over yourself that led to a breakthrough, right? With Cindy Lauper. So tell us, tell us that story too. And I have a question from my husband. What was the club in Hartford, Connecticut. Was the club in Hartford, Connecticut that you met this guy? It was either the Hartford Civic Center. Yeah. Or a place called Toad's Place. Toad's Place. Okay, I'll tell him. Yeah, he wanted me dead. He's like, what's the club? We've been to those clubs. So It was a really, really hot night. Really hot night. And I'm not too sure if those were the gigs, but it was a gig in Hartford, I remember. He was um, very curious. And, And it's also an example of, how you put a person first above your needs. Right. After the gig, it was really a hot, hot night. We were all in the dressing room in a real big hurry to get out of the dressing room and onto the bus because we had a long overnight drive. Being the sweaty drummer, I was always the last one out of the dressing room, and my road manager was going, hurry up, Sandy, get on the bus. Everybody else was on the bus. The artist was on the bus, the whole band, the crew, everybody was on the bus, ready to go, and I was rushing around the dressing room trying to get my stuff together and I put my carry-ons on my shoulder and there was this guy standing in the doorway with a camera and a pen I could have blew right by him I could have like any rock sure. star drummer uh, and many of them would have 
But I said, you know what? I'm going to engage with this guy because I always thought it was a novel idea where people place value on somebody signing their name on a piece of paper, the idea of an autograph. So, And he's there to see the drummer, for crying out loud. He's not there to see the artist whose name was on the marquee. So I engaged him, buddy, what can I do for you, man? I'm really in a hurry. Oh, you're a great drummer, blah, blah, blah. Can you sign this for me? I said, what's your name? He goes, Dave. Okay, Dave, here you go. Oh, one more thing. Can you take a picture with me, Sandy? I said, okay, hurry up. And he takes out this Instamatic camera. It, this was like 1980, I remember those. I remember it had those. A flash cube, a flash cube on the top. It's a Polaroid. <laughs> well, he aims it, aims, kind of aims it, takes the picture. I go, Dave, you got your picture, your autograph. I got to go. He goes, Oh, one more thing, Sandy. I'm a bass player here in Connecticut. Would you help me get a gig in New York City? So I said, well, Dave, I can't recommend you unless I hear you play. So here's my card, my home address, my home number. Send me a cassette of your play and I'll see what I can do. And he couldn't believe I was giving, this is your home number? You're giving me a home address? No big deal, Dave. Just send me the cassette. I left. He gave me a real big hug of appreciation. And uh, when I got home, eventually when I got home from that tour, there was his cassette in the mail. I opened it, listened to it. It wasn't really that good, but I kept my promise. I recommended it to some some management in, in New York City. Nothing really came of it. Three years later, uh, in the end of the summer, early fall of 83, he called me and he goes, hey, Sandy, thanks for recommending me. All those years ago, but thank you, but nothing ever came of it. But uh, I'm managing this girl now. She's going to be the biggest thing in 1984. And we just signed her to Epic Records. Uh, I want you to be in her band. I want you to come down to the studio and listen to some tracks that we're recording now. And I said, Dave, I can't join a baby band and, and ride in a Winnebago again and uh, you know share rooms again and whatever. Sandy, I don't want you to miss this opportunity. I said, well, Dave, everybody's new first project is going to be, they, they always think it's going to be the next big thing in the music business. And Sandy, you don't understand. Come down and at least meet this girl. So I went down in the studio. It turned out to be Cindy Lauper. She played me some of the tracks, some girls just want to have fun, the tracks that they were working on. And based on her personality, based on the fact that looking at her and seeing the way she dressed and being the way her hair was and the way, the sound of her voice and these tracks sounded really, really uh, catchy. Based on all of that, I ended up joining the band. I played side stick on time after time in that, in that, in that time very after session. Time time. That's correct. If you're lost, you can look and you will find me. If you fall, I will catch you. I'll be waiting. I'll Time be in. waiting. That's another thing that kind of hooked me on that gig was you look at Cindy Lauper, first impression, she looks a little bit on the ditzy side, like the, her voice and uh -huh. a little shallow, like all icing and no cake. But I listened to those lyrics and, and then talking to her. It was really, really inspirational that how how deep she was beneath the surface, you know. And she had a really engaging personality, and she really showed her appreciation and how much Dave liked my drumming and whatever. And she wanted me to join a band. So as a result of that, I joined the band, and uh, and uh, I was with her all of '84 towards the end of '84. Now, keep in mind that my, the biggest gig in my life at that time was that gig and it happened because of five minutes engaging with Dave in the doorway. I was really in a big hurry. I wanted to get on that bus, but I saw this guy in the doorway and I wanted to engage him. That was thanks enough from the God energy, from the universe for spending five minutes with this guy. And I ended up with the biggest gig of my life. You put, him, put first. him first. Aside, even behind my wishes, behind my road manager's wishes, yeah. <laughs> behind the band's wishes. But that wasn't it, Kathleen, because November 23rd, 1984, I was playing the Charlotte Coliseum with Cindy Lauper. And backstage, I met this woman. Her name was Sherry. And we started talking. And we and she couldn't hang out that night. But uh, I invited her to the show the next night in Atlanta. And she came to the show. She was 20 years old at the time. And she came to the show in Atlanta. And we had more time to spend together. We started seeing each other long distance. I went back on the road. She went back home to her job in Charlotte. And um, a year later, after seeing each other intermittently over a course of a year, I said, why don't you move up here? In November of 85, which was a year after I met her, she moved up to New York. In 1990, we got married. 1994, we had our daughter. And we're still together 39 years after. The, in November of 23, will be 39 years. And this is all as a result of five minutes with Dave Wolf in the doorway. Isn't that great? 
So, you know, sometimes the analogy I like to use is like sometimes you bring a shovel full of dirt and you get a dump truck worth of dirt in return. <laughs> you know what I mean? You don't you don't do it for anything in return, but sometimes, you know, what you get in return far exceeds what you put out there originally when you put yourself first. Other people first, sorry. Right. Sure. No, it's it's your message you giving without expecting. You know, right. truly giving without expecting anything in return. And then it comes back with many gigs and and career changing opportunity with Cindy Lauper and then the love of your life and then That's your correct. baby. My daughter is 28 years old. She's in the next room getting a manicure right now. Um, Good girl. <laughs> she's 28 and uh, she's going on the road. She's a road manager in her own right. She's going to be assistant, assistant road manager for um, Chrissy Hine and the Pretenders. So nice. she's going on the road with Chrissy Hine and the Pretenders and Guns N' Roses this summer, which is awesome. So Dave is the gift that keeps on giving to you That's and your correct. family and your life. And That's all correct. because of that, we're talking today and you're speaking all over the world. So let's change, uh, just just um, add to the conversation and, and focus on your beats, right? So when I was in the audience on January 31st, I love um, how you use the beat. So walk us through that, if you will. And I love that you start with God energy because I'm yes. a woman of faith as well. So, well, not not to place any opinion, but I think people are missing out when they when they they don't have faith in a power greater than themselves. They think they're walking around the planet in a little cocoon, and everything is upon them, or everything you know, whatever. But yeah, you refer you refer to beats. And in addition to playing beats on a drum set for over a half a century, I lived these principles. And somebody, when I mentioned this at a visage meeting, they said, you know what? The word beats also, based on your message, has to do with the heartbeat because you follow your heart and decisions what you have to make when you want to engage to somebody, you make people, you know, you just follow your heart. Anyway, the beats acronym stands for belief in a God energy, belief in a power greater than ourselves at work, the E is enthusiasm, which to me, have an enthusiastic, positive outlook on events that happen to you, on problems that happen, have an enthusiastic attitude. I know it's strange to have an enthusiastic attitude about a problem, but when you realize problems happen to make us learn or to, to educate us to do something differently, we grow as people. So with the idea of, hey, I got a problem, but after I sort this problem out, I'm going to be a better person or a stronger person or a more talented person or whatever it is. The A in beats is attitude. And the attitude that we have, the attitude, the thoughts that we have in our mind is the only, basically the only thing we have total control over. Because when we were born with a little bit of the God energy inside us, Kathleen, we were given the power of choice of what we pay attention to the power of choice of what thoughts we pay attention to. The T in beats is tenacity. Again, tenacity, when you have that faith and you have a quality attitude, positive attitude, and a belief and a faith and a desire to accomplish your goal and a doubt it will happen with the assistance of the God energy, and you have the God energy, the universal, infinite universe in your corner, anything is possible. And the last but not least is the element of service to others. Putting yourself secondary, putting the person that needs help or advice or even a smile in a supermarket or when somebody's checking your groceries in a supermarket, you look at the name and you go, hey, Kathleen, how are you doing today? Just have a conversation. Well, I hope you have a great evening and thank you for your service. Any kind of positivity you put out there, Kathleen, I believe that it comes back to you. Not only in equal measure, but sometimes as evidence in my life, it comes back to you in greater measure. You know, it's like that truckload of dirt you talked about earlier. <laughs> truckload of dirt, and you know, every every single gig, you look at the records behind me, and they represent several gigs Beautiful. that I've been involved with successfully. Every one of those has be, has come to me as a result, indirectly or directly, of me reaching out to somebody that needs my assistance or. We can't pay you what you need to get paid, but would you want to come to Frankfurt, Germany and play on this record? Whatever. Did I want to go to Frankfurt for three weeks and put drums on a German record? No, but I did because they showed their appreciation and whatever. And that led to me joining that band subsequently after that record and doing the 
we opened for Queen for three months in Europe in 1980. You know, doing a favor for a bass player in New York City. Is, he, he was the bass player and musical director for The Tokens that had a, a, a song called Lion Sleeps Tonight. Based on that encounter, I did him a favor by doing a Tokens gig because his mother's, his drummer's mother passed away and couldn't make a gig. With three days notice that I want to do the gig for hardly any money. And it was two hours from my house. I had to set up my own drums. It was a 12-hour turnaround. Did I want to do the gig? No, but I did it. Three months later, he calls me and he says, I'm musical director for the Monkees. Do you want to do the reunion tour this summer? Sure. That's a yes was, question. Was that, <laughs> right. Was that payment enough for helping Jerry, to Jerry, the bass player, out on that Tokens gig? Of course it was uh -huh. payment enough, but I did every reunion tour, almost every one that the Monkees did from 87 until Davy Jones passed away. Oh, that's so awesome. It was tremendously lucrative, me rehearsing for that first Monkees tour. I rehearsed at a studio in, in, in Manhattan because I lived in an apartment, and the, the owner of the studio on the way out when I'm paying for my time asked me, what were you doing in that room? I told him I'm going on the road with the Monkees. He goes, you ever think about teaching? We need a rock drummer faculty member here at the school. So I said, no, I never thought about teaching, but let's give it a go. And after I got off the road with the monkeys, I started teaching at this place called The Collective in New York City. And that started a 27 year teaching career. Amazing. Now I had my day gig that, you know, to keep the lights on and keep income coming in, in between yeah. tours and records. And not only that, I was teaching at the peak with 20 hours a week. So I was, I was becoming a better drummer myself. As a result of that, I did an instructional video at, at, in association with the collective, with the school, and that went multi-platinum. My first five-figure royalty check, as a result of that video, Kathleen, there was two months after my daughter was born. Wow, well, that's and awesome. Move, and I'm moving into a new house. So how the, how the dominoes fall in your favor, you have no idea. I can't, I couldn't write this script. I'm telling you, it's just, when I talk about it, people ask me about it. it. It amazes me every time I talk about it. It's like it still surprises you. It's like, wow, that all happened. And, you know, it's built upon these small moments right. that you recognized were important and you gave freely of yourself to the other person. Right. It was that, it was that simple. It's, um, you know, that song by Bette Midler, Human Kindness. You know, just a little bit of human kindness right. goes so far. Right. And look at how far it's taken you. Right. And I want to get into how the main message and themes of your book, Beat the Odds in Business and Life, can be applied to the business world. But we have to stop here. Stay tuned for the second part of my conversation with speaker and drummer Sandy Gennaro, where Sandy reveals some tips on how to overcome your judgmental tendencies. Everybody has a right to believe what they want to believe, politically, sexual orientation, whatever it may be, your taste in food, your taste in woman, your taste in men, whatever it is, everybody has a right to believe what they want to believe. This has been Dare to Care in the Workplace. To connect with Kathleen, go to KathleenQuinnBotaw.com. Kathleen's book, Dare to Care, is available wherever books are sold. Dare to Care in the Workplace is a production of Forbes Books.